Welcome, everybody. My name is Yoshiko Herrera. I'm the director of the Center for Russia, East Europe, and Central Asia, and also in the political science department. It's our pleasure today to sponsor via Krika a faculty roundtable on Boston, Chechnya, and terrorism. And we have three faculty members here to my left. Um, the first on the far left is Andrew Kidd from political science. Next is uh, Ted Gerber from sociology. And uh, next to me here is Yulai Shamaloglu from uh, Languages and Cultures of Asia, who is also the director of the Center for uh, the Middle East Studies Program, sorry, <laughs> Middle East Studies Program and the Central Asian Studies uh, Program. So we're going to um, go in order of left uh, to right, and uh, our hope is to provide a little bit of insight into the general context of terrorism, um, and then more specifically into the situation in Russia, Chechnya, and um, political Islam. So let's start first with Professor Kidd, who's going to speak on the more general um, uh, question of terrorism. Uh, thanks, and thanks, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so my job is to, to try to place this in the context of uh, recent terrorist attacks uh, and uh, terrorism as a phenomenon in general. Uh, so I'm going to look at the attack uh, just very briefly and the perpetrators, then compare it to uh, recent terrorist attacks and foiled plots. Uh, and failed terrorist attacks, uh, and think about it in terms of that uh, comparison in terms of the casualties, the, um, to some extent, the methods and uh, connections to the outside world, uh, and then a few other points of comparison to, to keep it in perspective. Uh, so what do we know about the Boston uh, bombing? Just the basic overview, right? It's Monday, two weeks ago, uh, the 15th of April, at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Uh, a couple of hours after the, the winners finished, but still when a lot of other people were coming in and around, two bombs uh, detonated, uh, made from pressure cookers, as we subsequently discovered, uh, packed with ball bearings and nails uh, and explosives. Uh, so fairly primitive, uh, pr primitive bombs, but nonetheless uh, capable of doing a fair amount of damage. Uh, the direct casualties were three killed, uh, and then a subsequent casualty was a police officer at MIT who was killed on the Friday of that week um, when the uh, suspects uh, sort of went on the rampage that led to their being killed and captured, respectively. So three fatalities plus one subsequently, uh, 264 injured and 14 amputees, and that is somewhat unusual in this context in the sense that and is, is attributed uh, in part to the bombs being placed on the ground, and so people were getting hit low down rather than higher up in their bodies. If the same injuries had been sustained higher up in their bodies, more people would have died. Uh, the perpetrators were two brothers, as we've all learned, uh, Tamerlan and Zokar Tsarnaev. I'm sure the other panelists can pronounce those names better than I can. Uh, emigrated to the United States in 2002. Uh, they, uh, the older brother is married uh, and had a three-year-old child. The younger brother is a naturalized American citizen, naturalized in September of 2012. So he became a citizen uh, less than a year before he detonated the bomb, which is another interesting point of comparison in the sense that other bombers, uh, one of the UK bombers in July of um, 2005 was also a naturalized citizen who had just been naturalized a year before he committed the bombing. Uh, which raises questions for a lot of people, like why would you become an American citizen if you hate the country so much that you want to perpetrate a terrorist attack of that kind uh, so soon afterwards, right? At what point in the process of the naturalization, because uh, it's a long process to, get, to become a naturalized citizen, at what point did he decide to become a terrorist, um, and why would he continue on with that process? Um, so putting this in the context of other terrorist attacks, 9-11, um, of course, is the most famous and for uh, justifiable reasons, almost 3,000 people dead. That's off the charts, though, in terms of terrorist casualties, uh, an order of magnitude greater than the, the nearest competitors. Um, uh, but nonetheless, of course, very salient. Um, Oklahoma City, the next biggest terrorist attack in the United States, killed 164 people, 165 uh, people. Um, but of course, that was a lone wolf attack. Timothy McVeigh was relatively speaking alone. He had one helper, uh, but he wasn't part of an organized group in any sense. It was, it was a pretty lone wolf sort of operation. The 93 World Trade Center bombing uh, by Ramzi Youssef uh, killed six, injured 1,000. Uh, so many more injuries uh, and a few more fatalities than the Boston bombing. 
Uh, he was trained in Afghanistan and aided by his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, who was the mastermind for the 9-11 uh, attack as well, subsequently. Um, and after that, you're basically out of successful bombings in, in terms of inside the United States. There really aren't any more uh, to speak of. Uh, another successful attack, uh, in some sense, is the Fort Hood shooting in 2009, uh, where uh, Nidal Hassan, who was in the United States Army, a Muslim in the United States Army, uh, purchased a auto semi-automatic handgun and uh, shot 13 people, injured 30. He was inspired in part by Anwar al-Awlaki, al who was an American radical preacher who subsequently left the United States uh, and spent time in uh, primarily Yemen, and was inspirational for a lot of subsequent attackers. He was subsequently killed by an American drone strike. Uh, if you go abroad, the prominent points of comparison are the London uh, July 7th bombing, 7-7, uh, in, in British Parliament, 7-7-2005. Subway bombings and bus bombing, uh, 52 people dead there, 700 injured. Also inspired by Al-Qaeda directly, uh, and interestingly, accompanied by political demands that the UK get out of Iraq, uh, among other things. So very clearly an act of terrorism in that case. Uh, and the Madrid bombing of 2004, a year previously, uh, 191 killed in that bombing and 1,800 injured uh, by local extremists. Uh, inspired by Al-Qaeda, but not clearly linked, not clearly trained uh, by them. So an indication of how very deadly um, even local extremists uh, without direct external support can be. Um, if you compare it to recent terrorist plots, uh, recent terrorist plots uh, that didn't uh, go all the way and didn't succeed, right? We've all heard Richard Reed, the so-called shoe bomber, the reason why we all have to take off our shoes in airports these days, unless you're 12 years or younger uh, nowadays. Uh, that was in 2001. Uh, Umar Abdul Malab, the underwear bomber of 2009, uh, tried to bring down a plane uh, also linked to Anwar al-Awlaki in Yemen. Th those attacks being on aircraft, if they succeeded, would have downed the aircraft, killing in the neighborhood of 300 people. And then there, of course, the Times Square bomber, uh, very kind of directly comparable. Recently, 2010, the Times Square bomber, uh, big car bomb placed in, a in, a, in an SUV in Times Square. Um, Faisal Shahad was Pakistani-born, a U.S. citizen as of 2009, the year before he committed the, uh, committed the attack, traveled to Pakistan and also linked and aspired to uh, al-Laki. Uh, so there are many points of comparison uh, as well. It's a serious terrorist attack. Uh, it could have been much worse with actually fairly minor tactical adjustments on the part of the bombers. If they placed the bombs higher up and so the injuries had been sustained in people's mid-regions, they would have died rather than had amputations. Uh, perhaps if they had gone inside somewhere in a crowded place, if you put a bomb outside in an open area, it's very easy to, dis to, to dis dissipate the explosive force. Um, and these guys are sort of inspired, at least in a vague way, by Muslim extremism uh, and the plight of Chechnya, which we'll hear a lot more about uh, in a second. Uh, however, some interesting aspects of this bombing uh, are, number one, it's not clearly linked to any external organization. Uh, there's no al-Qaeda there. There's not even an inspirational figure like al-Laki, as far as we can tell so far. I mean, we may be wrong about that. But certainly no organization providing them with training, with funds, with the kind of help that were uh, instrumental, in fact, essential for the 9-11 plot. Uh, for Ramzi Youssef's attack on the World Trade Center in 93, uh, and for some of the other uh, bombing plots as well. Uh, so we seem to have a, a very sort of, if not lone wolf, at least a dual wolf uh, attack here, right? Not linked to any external organization uh, and not accompanied by any political demands, uh, which leads some people to the question as to whether it should actually be called terrorism at all, given that there's no organization behind it and there's no demands being made. Uh, it sort of seems almost like expressive violence in some sense rather than actually politically motivated instrumental violence, violence that's designed to get somebody to do something uh, otherwise than they're already doing. Um, and it's relatively unsuccessful in that, in that comparison, right? The, in terms of the number killed and the number injured, relatively unsuccessful. It's kind of illust illustrative, I think, of a trend towards less well-organized attacks, less effective plots, with the, the degrading of um, Al-Qaeda's central command, 
uh, less well supported from abroad, less well funded, more spontaneous, almost casual, kind of expressive uh, in their in their nature, uh, almost sort of part of the cultural repertoire now, like school shootings and things like that. It's not as if it's part of a, a, a strategy, an organization, a set of tactics that have been well conceived to achieve a certain goal. Um, and just to put it also in a broader context to finish up um, in terms of uh, the reaction, uh, uh, it's of course a devastating event. I don't want to take anything away from that, from the families of the victims who died, from the in people who were injured and their families, et cetera. And the city of Boston was very resilient and responded in a great way. But in terms of how aggressively we should react and how we should think about Muslims or think about other issues, uh, I think it's important not to get, uh, not, to, not to, to think of this as an apocalyptic event. It's not an apocalyptic event uh, at all when you place it in the context of what's happened in the United States. That very week, uh, the West Texas fertilizer plant blew up and killed 15 people and injured 160. That was two days after the this, this shooting. Um, on April 15th, uh, according to a database that keeps track of these things, 14 people were killed in gun violence in the United States, uh, homicides and various uh, gun violent events. Uh, in 2004, a year for which I found data on this, uh, nine people per day on average drowned in this country. So if you place terrorism on the scale of bad things that happen to people in the United States, it's actually fairly uh, low down on the scale. The chance of dying of a terrorist attack in the United States, if you consider from 90, 1970 to 2007, that's including 9-11, of course, 70 to 2007 is one in 3.5 million on an annual basis, which is way behind traffic accidents at one in 8,200, uh, homicide and drowning in bathtubs. So, it's in terms of uh, uh, the level of catastrophe, it's not on the scale of, of other things, and we should perhaps temper our reactions uh, accordingly. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kidd. And next we have Professor Ted Gerber from Sociology Department, also former director of CRECA, and uh, generally an expert on demography uh, as well as um, on uh, Russian uh, sociology and politics too, if I may say so. Thank you. So I do have some uh, visual aids. Um, let me just see if I can operate this. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about Chechia and give sort of uh, some of the background about uh, recent developments in the last two decades in Chechnya, uh, very sort of cursory overview, uh, but also talk some about the, the problem of terrorism within Russia in particular that has been associated with conflict in Chechnya. Uh, so Chechnya is a very uh, tiny uh, little region. It's uh, sort of equivalent to an American state in terms of its uh, political status within the Russian Federation. Um, as you can see there, but if you look at the scale, you know, it's barely um, 100 uh, kilometers across um, and, and width-wise, and it's found in the larger region of the North Caucasus. So the Caucasus uh, region refers to the mountain range in that area. It's a, an isthmus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in the southern edge of Russia's borders. And uh, the northern uh, regions there, uh, Karachayo, Cherkessia, Kabardino, Wakaria, North Ossetia, Ingushetia, and so forth, Dagestan, those are all part of R the Russian Federation today. And those are typically referred to as the North Caucasus in distinction to the South Caucasus, which consists of the countries of Georgia and Azerbaijan, both of which border Russia, and then Armenia, which is just to the north of those two countries. So, uh, Chechnya, this whole region has typically been um, a very um, uh, conflict-ridden region. It was very difficult for the Russian Empire to subdue this territory. Um, Chechnya in particular, um, uh, by and large, you could say, came under Russian control in the early 19th century, although um, like other uh, of these sorts of uh, regions in this uh, larger area of the North Caucasus, uh, the Chechens were always rebellious and resisted Russian control um, uh, violently at times. So whenever the Russian government has gone through periods of weakness, there's, there's typically been a period of insurrection or insurgency uh, centered in Chechnya, but also in some of the neighboring um, areas. Um, so most recently then, moving ahead, let me get this, oops. I was never good at these things. Um, okay, so I wanted to give a brief timeline of sort of key events in Chechnya since uh, the early 1990s. So the Soviet Union collapsed in 1992, and this, of course, was one of those periods of 
a weakness of the Russian uh, federal state uh, because, uh, of course, there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of uncertainty about uh, what would transpire within the Russian government uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. And um, there, there was at the time um, a, a series of protests, street protests within the Chechen Republic and its capital of Grozny demanding independence and freedom. They established uh, sort of a movement for independence uh, with its parliament and its representation, uh, representative bodies. And ultimately they elected, uh, or they chose uh, a fellow named Jokar Dudayev who had been um, a colonel in the Russian Air Force um, as their leader. Um, and he claimed independence from Russia in 1992. And then the Republic adopted um, a constitution establishing itself as a, actually as a secular state. So the, in terms of Islam, so the Chechens historically have been an Islamic people. They've never been known for being especially devout in terms of their practice of Islam. And it's noteworthy that uh, initially they, they established itself quite explicitly as a secular state. Well, the Russian government eventually uh, decided it didn't want to put up with uh, having one of its republics uh, secede effectively from the Russian Federation. Yeltsin was, con Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, was concerned about the precedent that would set for other republics. So at the end of 1994, uh, the Russian government sent in uh, military troops uh, to essentially bring the republic to heel, uh, resulting in the first Chechen war, which lasted until 1996. This was a very brutal campaign, very unpopular in Russia. Um, at the time, there was widespread coverage of uh, aerial bombings, for example, of the capital of Grozny. Um, and there was so uh, on news reports, you could see imagery of uh, a very um, uh, harsh, uh, military actions, casualties, civilians. Uh, there was much criticism of the campaign in the Russian press. And as a result, it became a real thorn in President Yeltsin's side. He sought an end to the conflict. And so a ceasefire was brokered by an um, uh, individual named General, a uh, general in the Russian army named Lebed, who then subsequently died in a mysterious uh, helicopter accident um, as his popularity was soaring. Um, so in 1996, there was a ceasefire, but there was never really a settlement to the conflict between Chechnya and Russia. So Chechnya became a de facto independent state and rapidly descended into lawlessness without uh, the power of the Russian state to sort of keep things under control. You had roving bands of, of um, uh, warlords and so forth. Also at the same time, the Chechen cause became uh, something of a minor cause celeb within the Islamic jihadist world because they were a Muslim people, because they had been uh, attacked brutally by the force of the Russian military. Uh, Al-Qaeda and other uh, Islamic, uh, international Islamic extremist groups uh, began to take up the Chechen cause as one of the jihadist causes. And you had the influx of uh, uh, Muslim extremists into the country. So um, many argue that this was actually the time that you know, Islam became to be uh, a factor in the sort of what, what had up to that point been largely a secessionist movement uh, pitting insurgents against the Russian government. So there was an influx of um, you know, a number of individuals from places like Saudi Arabia and Jordan and so forth into Chechnya. Uh, there were attempts to impose Sharia law, sometimes at local level, sometimes more broadly. There was widespread chaos. There, was a, there were a lot of kidnappings of uh, various uh, diplomats and uh, human rights activists, journalists, Russian government representatives. And then there were some uh, incursions into neighboring territories by uh, Chechen uh, radicals during this inter intervening period of de facto independence. And then in 1999, there were a series of uh, uh, bombings uh, that took place in Moscow apartment buildings. And these were blamed on the Chechens by the Russian government. Um, although there, there has been some controversy that there are those who see uh, actually that this was a conspiracy on the part of the FSB, which is the Russian uh, successor to the KGB, in order to whip up anti-Chechen frenzy. At any rate, in the public, all the public discussion of these apartment bombings, uh, they were laid at the hands of the Chechens. And as a result, uh, Russia then uh, sent in troops once again in a campaign spearheaded by, at the time, Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. Now this time, uh, the campaign was very different. It, it was similar in that it was remarkably harsh and brutal and ruthless in terms of uh, uh, all out uh, war, uh, destructive, this, you know, bringing to bear the whole destructive force of the Russian military into Chechnya. Um, it consisted of sort of mop up operations or cleaning, uh, clean, clean, cleansing operations where they would seize entire villages. 
um, and, and uh, take the men away and put them into camps. Uh, there were many allegations of, uh, of torture and rape, brutality. Um, I can go into some of the episodes. But basically, it was a, an all-out very brutal um, military campaign. Eventually, the Chechen insurgency was really brought to heel, was really defeated. There you know, were, were still isolated groups in the mountains. But they did inflict sort of guerrilla-type casualties on the Russian forces. Um, so. Um, Putin, by the mid-2000s, at that point he was president, he wanted to bring the, the conflict to an end. There were concerns in the Russian public about the levels of Russian, continuing Russian casualties. Um, so basically he adopted a strategy of Chechenizing the conflict. And uh, so he uh, identified some former rebels, uh, a father and son team actually. So the father was Ahmad Kadyrov, and he was elected president of Chechnya in 2004, or 2003. Then he was assassinated by a, an explosion in 2004. And then his son actually uh, became prime minister in 2006, Ramzan Kadyrov, who remains uh, the, in charge of Chechnya today. Oops, I keep going back. OK, so um, under Kadyrov, uh, the, the, conf the military conflict has been uh, completely Chechenized. That is, Russia's uh, formal military presence was quickly brought down to near zero. And Kadyrov has ruled the country um, really with an iron hand with his uh, group of, uh, of loyal sort of uh, uh, soldiers who are called the Kadyrovtsi because they really have loyalty to him. Um, there was a, an involvement of Islamic radicals in the, uh, the course of the Second War in particular. Most of them have been either uh, captured or, for the most part, instead killed. So, for example, um, Aslan Maskharov, who was the nominal uh, head of the resistance movement, was killed in 2005. Shamil Basayev, a well-known uh, terrorist, uh, who, who was behind a number of terrorist acts in Russia, was killed in 2006. Um, these groups were really, uh, have been defeated, and, and there's really no insurgency to speak of in Chechnya today. It's instead ruled by um, a, a brutal dictator, this, this Kadyrov, who with Russian support has um, per persecuted his opponents using extremely violent means. Uh, he's been widely criticized for human rights violations, so any criticism, any sign of um, opposition has been ruthlessly suppressed. Um, he's, been, he's adopted some very you know, conservative social policies and so forth. Um, some of his opponents have been famous uh, journalists, Russian human rights journalists who have reported on some of these abuses have been killed. So Anna uh, Politkovskaya was murdered in her Moscow apartment building in uh, 2006. More recently, Natalia Estemirova was uh, kid abducted and then shot to death uh, in Chechnya. Um, part of Kadyrov's success has come from the backing of the Russian government, which has pumped uh, millions and millions of rubles into uh, the republic in order to rebuild it. And um, you know, by all accounts, I've never actually been to Chechnya, but by all accounts, uh, there are many sort of fancy new buildings in Grozny. Where the city was completely razed during the military campaign. Uh, but um, now it has lots of sparkly, shining new buildings, water parks, zoos. Uh, Kadyrov has a bit of a cult of personality thing going on. He does things like hire professional soccer teams uh, for him to play against with his Chechen team. And of course, he scores five goals and defeats them. Uh, he's famous for having these big parties. He brings in, uh, you know, for example, uh, he, he's had in his recent birthday party, he brought in, he paid a lot of money to bring in Hillary Swank as one of his guests. And when Human Rights Watch found out about this, they were you know, very critical of Hillary Swank. And she had to pol apologize and say, oh my gosh, I had no idea that this was such a bad guy who tortured people personally and so forth. She gave the money back. Um, but nonetheless, there has been sort of st stability with respect to the insurgency in Chechnya itself. In the meantime, however, the violence has spread from Chechnya to the neighboring republics, especially in Gushetia and Dagestan, where um, there you know, recently have, have been a, a real surge, a, a continuing wave of low-level sorts of terrorist attacks. It's not really clear how many of them are, 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 how much of it is Islamic terrorism, how much of it is just criminal activity, how much of it is people angry because the Russian troops you know, have detained their relatives. Uh, but there is sort of low-level uh, smoldering violence, particularly in Dagestan and Ingushetia. Um, also, in Russia itself, there's a growing backlash among the Russian people who are angry about uh, the government spending money. So Alexei Navalny, who rose to prominence in the protests following the, um, uh, following the uh, uh, Duma and presidential elections of uh, uh, just over a year ago, uh, he um, helped promote this phrase, stop feeding the Caucasus, is one of the sort of slogans to rally Russian nationalists, saying it's enough of giving money to the Caucasus. 
uh, region. And then finally, most recently of all, just a few weeks ago, the, the famous Magnitsky list came out. This is a list of Russian uh, politicians who have been deemed guilty of human rights violations and therefore banned from traveling to the United States or for holding bank accounts in the United States. And there were two lists. One of them was a public list. The other was a secret list. And it turned out that Kadyrov himself was named on the secret Magnitsky list. And you know, he made a public, uh, he gave a public press conference where he said, this is ridiculous. The United States can go to hell. You know, I don't belong to this list. Uh, but it's the, the timing of this particular incident is particularly interesting, perhaps, from that perspective. Um, OK, so then uh, what is the role? I mean, uh, I want to make it clear. Um, Oops, once again, I've managed to go the wrong way. There we go. Um, so there's no question that, that Chechen insurgents, rebels, terrorists, whatever you want to call them. In fact, Putin just um, last weekend in one of these sort of uh, television or t uh, telephone call-in shows he does uh, once a year, he went to great lengths to say that, uh, OK, this Boston bombing, the shows, you know, once again, no one would listen to us. Everybody tells us that uh, these are insurgents, or these are secessionists, or these are rebels. They're not. They're terrorists. I've been trying to say all along that these are Islamic terrorists who are trying to destroy us. And once again, we see proof of this. Well, this is sort of the line that he took after 9-11 as well. Um, but the reality is that there have been a, you know, a large number of terrorist acts perpetrated within Russia, some of which with substantial casualties, that um, various Chechen rebel groups have claimed responsibility for. So I've listed some of the, the key uh, signature events up there. So I put the apartment bombings. Now, as I said, you know, those were, I mean, so first of all, those killed 300 people. They weren't trivial by any means. There's, there, is, there are some claims that this was actually a conspiracy by the FSB. This has never been demonstrated. I'm reluctant to come out and say that I think there is strong evidence in favor of it, but I can say a little bit more about the anecdotal evidence that suggests it might be the case um, in the Q&A. Um, but aside from that one, there's really not much controversy. All the rest of these clearly are, have been perpetrated by groups associated with radicals in Chechnya. Uh, so, for example, there was a, a seizure of a theater in Moscow uh, in the production of uh, the play Nord Ost in 2002, uh, in which 129 hostages died when the federal troops gassed the uh, theater in order to um, demobilize the terrorists and went in. There was a Moscow metro bombing which killed 40 people in 2004. Uh, the the well-known and infamous siege of a school in uh, Beslan, a small town in North Ossetia, and the first day of school in September 2004 resulted in 330 deaths. Um, at the same time, uh, roughly two airplanes were downed by uh, bombs, bombing attacks, killing 89 people. There was an attack in Nalchik, the capital of the neighboring Republic of kabardino balkaria in which dozens were killed in fire fights throughout the, the downtown in 2005. Uh, more recently, last uh, four or five years, there was a train bombing of a train uh, between Moscow and St. Petersburg that killed 39. There were suicide bombings in the Moscow metro in 2010, killing 40. And then in Damodedovo Airport, uh, which I'm sure Yoi and uh, Yulai have been to, I don't know about Andy, I've certainly been to it many times, there was a bombing that killed 35 people in 2011. All these attacks were claimed uh, by the Chechens, and some of them by Basayev and others. So there doesn't seem to be much dispute that there really was uh, terrorist activity within Russia that uh, was or originated in, in Chechnya. Um, so, so it's not the case, uh, as some have expected, that uh, the, the Chechens have, uh, have only been victimized in this scenario. There have perpetrated terrorist acts in which innocent civilians have been killed in Russia, including school children. Okay, so I, I want to uh, then raise sort of three questions, of which Good, which I, um, I don't necessarily have the answer to. So, so one question that uh, scholars have debated is to what extent uh, within Chechnya and within the region more generally, has, have these conflicts been based on Islamic uh, radicalism versus pure uh, secessionist aspirations? That is, to what extent is it just a, ca uh, a case of, of minority, small minority ethnic groups aspiring to be independent from Russia, being um, unhappy with Russian rule and fighting for their independence? versus uh, uh, Islam, Islamists who are seeking to establish a, a sort of caliphate uh, spanning the region of Salafist-oriented uh, Islam. And there are American uh, policy wonks and advisors and uh, prominent uh, scholars in, 
and, and Washington, D.C. think tanks who argue that the, Russia really does face uh, a major um, Islamist threat, that this is a case of jihadists moving into Russia, seeing, you know, going to Russia's soft southern underbelly and trying to foment violence and, and, and create an independent Islamic republic. Uh, there are those who are skeptical of this view and argue that um, actually this is really driven by you know, sort of long-term historical grievances and secessionist impulses. And yes, the Islamists have seen this as an opportunity. They have sent people in. There has been some attempt. But that um, the uh, role of Islam Islam and all this has been really overblown and overstated. Um, then what about anti-Americanism in uh, Chechnya and the North Caucasus? Well, uh, in fact, there's really very little evidence that anti-Americanism, even, uh, even among the Islamists who've been active there, has, has played a big role. Uh, if anything, the United States has generally been perceived um, as a potential, um, not, not so much an ally of the secessionists, insurgents, whatever you want to call them, but at least a force that has been critical of the Russian government, that has stood up for human rights, and that uh, uh, might be uh, seen as a source of, uh, of uh, positive public opinion in the cause for Chechen liberation. You know, the United States historically is viewed as an enemy of Russia and the Russian government. And um, um, I do have a little bit of data, which I'll, uh, I'll put up there. So I did uh, a survey, not in Chechnya, but in the neighboring republics of Dagestan, Kabardino, Balkaria, in North Ossetia uh, in 2006. And this is a survey exclusively of young men. And so uh, we did ask question how they feel about different uh, uh, ethnic, religious, and national groups. And uh, looking at this, so you can see, so this is the percentage of people who uh, say they view this group either with dislike or with fear. And um, so in Dagestan, the most heavily is Islamic of these three uh, regions, the, the, there, there is some, somewhat over 20% say they view Americans with uh, dislike or fear. Interestingly enough, though, that's not really too different from the percentage who view Chechens in the same way. Um, and moreover, the, um, the um, uh, difference between Muslims and non-Muslims uh, within these republics tend to be very scant. So the punchline is, yes, there is some anti-Americanism in these republics, but actually there's a lot of anti-Americanism in Russia more generally. And the levels of anti-Americanism you see from the survey data in these republics don't differ at all, nor do they vary along uh, religious sectarian lines. So um, you know, ba basically, I don't think there's much evidence at all that anti-Americanism is a particularly pronounced or especially widespread phenomena in these areas. Um, finally, then the question, of course, arises. So, um, you know, given that, the, that violence has spread outside of Chechnya, that there's a, a currently a, you know, a very vicious and brutal regime in Chechnya itself, and um, you know, perhaps there are signs. You know, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't think that this. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an FBI investigator, but I don't think that um, uh, the brother, the Tanayev brothers, received instructions or 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 were trained for this act uh, in the region. Uh, I think the evidence is is coming out that suggests that, that that's not the case. Uh, but why did this even come up? You know, as a question, as a topic. Well, they happen to be ethnic Chechens, although they don't seem to have spent any time in in Chechnya to speak of. Um, uh, but, but why do we associate terrorism with this area? Well, of course, there have been terrorist acts, um, as, as I've noted, but the question arises to what extent uh, are Russian government policies itself and the extremely harsh um, uh, policies that, that Russia has really been implementing in the region since the early 90s in its successive wars and its support for a very brutal dictator, to what extent are are, have they contributed to the problem by fomenting more extremism, more violence, and a continuing cycle of uh, retribution? Um, okay, so that's really uh, what I have to say, and I'll pass the floor on then to you. Great. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. That might be more interesting than what I have to say. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Ted. And next we have Professor Yulai Shamaloglu from Languages and Cultures of Asia, and one of the leading experts on campus on Central Asia. Thank you very much, uh, Yoi, and I'd like to thank Krika for organizing this event. And that was a very, very thorough um, treatment of Chechnya by my colleague and friend Ted Gerber. And I'll step back a, a bit and ask, uh, is this really about Chechnya and is this really about Islam? And uh, he alluded to, uh, to some of that um, as well. So the first thing that I'd like to do is start with a, a quote that my uh, friend Paul Goebel says, uh, uh, Johar Dudayev actually said. He said, apparently, and I, this is quotes, so uh, I'm a good Muslim, I pray three times a day. Uh, and so I'm not sure about the authenticity of this, 
but it's just kind of an opening to the whole question about, you know, who are the Chechens, what is Chechen Islam about, and, and so what is Soviet Islam about? So the first thing then is, let's just say just a couple of words about traditional Chechen society and trad traditional Chechen religion, not because that's going to explain who the Chechens are and why these bombing attacks took place, uh, because I, I don't want to follow religious determinism in this case, but I do want to contrast the differences about what Chechen society used to be, what it's become, what Chechen religion has become, about what the influences are, and to what extent that does that have anything to do with the Tsarnaev brothers? So first of all, uh, in the pre-Soviet era, so in the 19th century, Chechen society was very heavily organized on clans and clan unions, and Chechen Islam is very, very heavily influenced by Sufism or Islamic mysticism. So you have the prominence of the Qadiriya order, which is an offshoot of the Naqshbandiya, or also the Naqshbandiya uh, order. And so, you know, this is not the place to go into a long uh, discourse on what uh, Islamic mysticism is about. But in general, mysticism is about a closer personal relationship uh, with God. In the case of Islam, there's the cult of the Prophet Muhammad, for example, through uh, poems celebrating the, the birth of the Prophet uh, Muhammad. And at the same time, in various societies, like in North Africa or in the Caucasus, these uh, orders can also serve as informal or underground networks. And in the case of the North Caucasus, this was very important in the anti-colonial uh, resistance uh, in the 19th century. And one of the famous individuals connected to that uh, was uh, uh, Sheikh Shamil. Um, I'm not related to him, by the way. Uh, uh, and so you know, he was captured by the Russians in 1859. And he was, at the same time, a a religious leader and a, uh, an anti-colonial resistance leader, well, one might say. Um, so in Soviet times, Chechens became very secularized, just like most Muslims in the, uh, in the USSR. So you know, basically, to what extent was knowledge, esoteric knowledge that the, the Sufi orders through their leaders would preserve, to what extent was that one generation away from dying out completely? It's not clear to me how much continuity there is in terms of pre-Soviet times knowledge about esoteric Islam and uh, these mystical traditions, and you know whether what we have today, to the extent that we have it, is a direct continuation, or is it sometimes the kind of invention of traditions trying to revive earlier practices? And so, you know, it's uh, this strong secularization of Muslims in the USSR is reflected in the background of the Tsarnaev family. So if you, it, we, we've heard, this is a very complex case. There's lots of new um, developments and news reports that come out every day. But certainly in the case of the, the father of the, the Tsarnaev brothers, it doesn't sound like he's a, a devout Muslim necessarily at all. And there have been hints that he may have been involved even in security uh, forces and so on, which might have been in, in fact fighting Islamic uh, uh, forces uh, and insurgencies. And if you've seen the uncle, uh, on television when he was uh, interviewed from his home in Maryland, you know, he looks very much like a, a, a homo sovieticus, one of these, you know, very, you know, non-religious uh, uh, persons who in fact even felt the uh, radicalization or Islamization of the Tsarnaev brothers, of the older brother Tamerlan Tsarnaev, to be something that he found concern, of con a cause for concern, and he even complained to the family about this. Now, whether there was somebody in Cambridge who radicalized that brother or not, that's a whole other issue, and there's many conflicting reports, and if I remember, I'll get back to that later on. So the, the thing is that there is this deep secularization, and that's the tradition that this family comes out of. There's several other aspects to history, uh, and I'll just touch upon it very, very briefly. Uh, it's also worth keeping in mind that in 1944, uh, at the height of World War II, uh, Stalin instituted the deportation of many peoples from the North Caucasus. So Crimean Tatars, Chechens, English, Karachais, Crimean Tatars, Volga Germans, and so on. And they were put in internal exile in cattle, on cattle, car, in cattle cars to Central Asia, and whatever, 30% died. Uh, en route to Central Asia. So that is you know, an important fact to, uh, that's relevant here too, because the Tsarnaev brothers you know, spent 
you know, a good part of their childhood in Kurdistan. And if you go to the website of Radio Free Europe, uh, Free Europe Radio Liberty, so rferl.org, you know, you can find a, um, interviews with people from that village in Kyrgyzstan where they are with English subtitles and so on. So they didn't grow up in Kyrgyzstan. And if it's up to Ramzan Kadyrov, the president of Chechnya, they grew up in the United States, it's a, U a US phenomenon. That's, so there, there's that aspect too. So from 1957 on, Chechens, some Chechens and North Caucasians and others returned to their homelands. Or that's also led to a conflicted situation because people, other ethnicities were now occupying their homes and so on. So you, know, the, you had a, a generation which either grew up in, in, in dislocation or then returned and had another kind of, of dislocation. So that's kind of some background that's relevant. I'll tie that in uh, to a couple of things later on. So uh, we had, in the 1980s, there was a really important phenomenon. And that was, of course, in uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in, the, uh, in late uh, 1979. And that was a real major phenomenon, a historical phenomenon of the 1980s. And that's relevant in part because uh, uh, Ahmed Rashid reports, for example, in his book on the Taliban, that in 1989 he saw all kinds of, of citizens of, of what was then the USSR you know, on, on the border between Pakistan and Kabul. So there were lots of people who were representing you know, Central Asian nationalities, maybe Caucasian nationalities you know, that were Muslim and so on, fighting in Afghanistan among the Mujahideen. And of course, after 9-11, the word Mujahideen uh, or, or struggler for jihad um, has a bad connotation, but of course, in Ronald Reagan's day, those were the freedom fighters that we supported, that you know, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan supported. So you know, th those, those people who became radicalized in the struggle against the atheist communists were radicalized through the support of your or your parents' taxpayer dollars, including Stinger missiles, of course. So, one of the things that Afghanistan attracted were, uh, in addition to Osama bin Laden, various citizens of, of uh, Arabic-speaking countries, of Arab countries, who became known as the Arab Afghans. And as Ted said, once you had the, the Chechen War of 94-96, this became, he says, a minor cause celebre. I think it's more, more than minor. I think it became a major cause celebre for the, for, uh, the jihadists. And so you had, you know, uh, I don't know the numbers, but there was some kind of trickle or stream of jihadists from uh, Afghanistan or wherever they were, some of them Arabs, some of them returning uh, uh, Soviet citizens and so on, or for former Soviet citizens who now saw the struggle or the war in Chechnya as an important struggle that was their own in terms of global jihad. So in the past, Chechnya had this kind of more mysticism-inspired Islam. In Soviet times, it was secular. And you know, when we talk about radical Islam or we talk about Salafi Islam, you know, Muslims who are trying to live you know, uh, the, like in the times of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, or Wahhabis, which is kind of related, but that's the official creed in Soviet, uh, in Soviet Arabia, yes, yeah, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, um, that came into being in the 18th century as a reaction to popular Islam and as a rejection of Sufism, so of Islamic mysticism. Uh, and you know, it's the stern kind of Islam where you know, women aren't driving and you're not going to hear music and so on. And it's really not representative of the Muslim world as a whole. It's, it's very much at one end of the spectrum. So it was people with those kinds of beliefs because the Mujahideen were supported by Saudi Arabia in part, and they were supporting the most conservative elements of the Mujahideen or of, of the resistance. And they were not popular with the Northern Alliance, Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, or General Dostum and others. So this was the, the, the first time you had the beginning well, historically, maybe not the first time, but early 20th century, there were things too. But, but let's say in terms of a major infusion of, of what you might call orthodox Islam or bare bones Wahhabi or Salafist Islam and this jihad tradition, this really came during the time of the Chechen war. But you know, the, the, that's not where the, these Tsarnaev brothers grew up uh, either. And there's one additional footnote to, to that, that, that first Chechen war. You know, we sometimes, if you look at um, maps of oil pipeline routes, it's very striking how all, so many of those were crossing through Grozny. You know, that's, that's you know, it just, it, that, that's, that's very, very interesting. So let me just try to kind of move on and, and go to kind of a close. So, so Chechnya is important. These guys are, are ethnic Chechens or half ethnic Chechen, as Yoi might say. 
Um, and so, but Chechnya was not where uh, they grew up. You know, it's Kyrgyzstan. Uh, uh, they've had, uh, you know, the United States uh, and, and, and other stops. And so what we see in, in the Chechnya of Ramzan Kadyrov, who's receiving strong support from Moscow to impose order, he's kind of representing a new fusion of Chechen nationalism and in a way a kind of his own specific and special brand of this kind of new age mystical Islam. But next door to Chechnya is Dagestan. And Dagestan was mentioned by Ted. And Dagestan is a, a, a really other important focus that we need to, to kind of say a few words about and then, and then I'll, I'll conclude or, or I'll stop. So next story, so there you, you have this kind of very uh, Islamic uh, part of the Russian Federation and probably in the whole territory of the former USSR, it's the, the most heavily re-Islamized uh, place with lots of Islamic universities and so on. Half of the, uh, the Russian quota for the Hajj goes to people from Dagestan and they think it's not uh, enough. Uh, there you see a struggle, an ongoing struggle. I mean, civil society is in danger in Dagestan, and you have the, the Salafists there who uh, may be leading some kind of insurgency, and they're in conflict with um, th those people who are representing the more traditional Sufi-inspired Islam there. And, and so uh, Dagestan is important in part because the older brother, um, Tamerlan Sar uh, Sarnayev, spent much of 2012 uh, in, in Dagestan, and I'm basing this on news reports, and here it's not just like things like the Boston Globe and New York Times, but there are English translations uh, uh, of various kinds of accounts from the Russian press, Moscow Times, uh, Muckraking and Lies from Izvestia, uh, and other kinds of, of sources that, that are doing a lot of interesting reporting, and a lot of it conflicts, so you don't really know what's right. But the thing is that the older brother, uh, Tamerlan, spent much of 2012 in Dagestan. We don't know quite what he did there, but there are fresh allegations in the press from the last several days uh, and in the US analytical sites like the Jamestown Foundation and so on, questioning, wondering whether he contacted uh, a one Mahmoud Mansur Nidal, I don't know what his ethnicity is, it, it could be an Arab name, it could be something else, who was considered to be a recruiter for the Dagestani insurgency and who was killed in a shootout on May 19th, 2012. There's also speculation that he have met, may have met with a Canadian convert to Islam, William Plotnikov, who was killed in a shootout on July 14th, 2012. And Tamerlan Sarnayev apparently left Mahachkala, the capital of Dagestan, about two days later. Uh, he had ostensibly gone to Mahachkala to see to Dagestan to see family and to get a Russian passport, but he left apparently without picking up his Russian passport. Now, uh, according to the French scholar uh, of political Islam, Olivier Roy, or Olivier Roy, if, you, if you're looking for it, R-O-Y, so for Islamists in, in Al-Qaeda and others, it was never really about the core territories of the Middle East, but rather places like Bosnia and Afghanistan and in the 90s, Chechnya, and today it's more like Mali, Mauritania, and Yemen. And so, as is the case with some lone Islamist uh, bombers and murderers in Europe, uh, uh, these individuals discovered Islam in Europe, or in the case of the Tsarnaev uh, brothers in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And one of the issues about these kinds of loners is that they're not necessarily integrated into Muslim communities, and even uh, Tamerlan had a falling out with the local, uh, 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 with the local mosque, I believe, with regard to Martin Luther King. Uh, I, I think it was about that. So it's not clear in the end whether the Tsarnaev brothers were really motivated by political uh, Islam. And just today I read on one blog, America blog, uh, a, a posting pointing out that, you know, based upon media reports, the younger brother uh, Johar had become an American citizen, but the older brother Tamerlan was denied citizenship. And so after that, I think after that, so he, he had this dream of gaining, trying to gain naturalization as an American citizen by gaining a spot on the US Olympic boxing team. And he had competed for, uh, in the regional Golden Gloves uh, competition. He was not uh, successful. And he was hoping to compete again in the following year. But the next year, the rules were changed, disqualifying permanent residents who were not citizens 
from participating. So is it possible, and I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but, but that's a picture of somebody who really, really wants very, very hard to become an American, and then, or a US citizen, and then his dreams are taken away from him. So is it in the end possible that he became disillusioned because he wanted to be an American too much? Otherwise, there's little evidence for a cell in Boston that would have radicalized him. Uh, statements to, uh, by his uh, uncle Ruslan about uh, a supposed Misha to the contrary. So in the end, did he self-radicalize in a Western environment, which is a phenomenon that Olivier Roy describes for, for Europe? Uh, and you know, if so, perhaps you know, we can follow Roy in saying that in the end, this is less about religion and perhaps more similar to Columbine. Thank you. Great, well thank you very much to all of our panelists. I just wanna uh, reiterate a couple of questions before opening it up to the audience um, that came out of some of the presentations. And the first was um, that in political science we would typically define terrorism as some kind of act of violence that has a specific political message or appeal. And as Andy mentioned, we haven't so far uncovered evidence of a specific political message or appeal. So I think it is actually, even though we sort of talk about it as if, assuredly as if it is an act of terror, I think it's actually a, a question to say, is it an act of, it's, it's an act of violence for sure, but is it terrorism per se, just in the same way that with Columbine or Sandy Hook or some of these other acts of violence, we wouldn't necessarily classify those as um, terrorists. I think the Chechen connection is another question to ask, given what we've just learned about Chechen and the Chechen conflict. Uh, there's lots of evidence that there's been terrorist acts by Chechens, especially within Russia. But is, what is the Chechen connection here? So the father is Chechen, the mother is Avar. That's one of the 20 major, let's say, ethnic groups in this neighboring region of Dagestan. So Dagestan is a much harder phenomenon, I think, for Americans to understand because it doesn't have one group of Dagestanis. There's a lot of different people that live there. And I just think it's interesting if we said these two brothers are Dagestani, their mother is Avar, she's from Dagestan, um, what would we make of that? You know, we'd, it would be harder for us to say what that means because we don't have a narrative of Dagestan, much less Avartsi, or what, what does it mean to be Avar? But that's where he spent time, was in Machachkala, uh, uh, there on the, the Caspian Sea. So I just think that's an interesting question to ask about the Chechen connection. And then as Yulai brought up, the connection to Islam also, is there a connection to Islam? Maybe that's different from the connection, if, if there is one, to Chechnya or even to Dagestan or Russia. And um, uh, you know, how, would we, how would we evaluate that? And then just finally, as Yulia brought up, there's also potentially personal, personal factors, mental illness. There could be other, other, other things on, on the table. So, um, so thank you to the panelists. And